Okay, so let, let's let's track back a bit to mm. okay, you've done an ethnography, you're mm. going into one school has particular characteristics, but you haven't in any way portrayed it as typical. Yeah. But rather there are things going on, particularly in the politics, that make it an interesting yeah. place to do the yeah. research. Um, but you chose to use discourse analysis mm. as, as your, your main method of analysis. What was attractive about that and why did it seem to address the questions you want to ask? Um, there are several reasons that are, I guess, both contextual and conceptual. Um, from the Irish point of view, um, generally speaking, as I said earlier on, um, talk about race is just non-existent. Um, so how do you analyze something that doesn't exist in, mm. in real terms? Mm. Uh, no, of course, that's, that's, that to say the talk about race is non-existent is, is not true. I mean, um, sometimes I felt that I could just, I, I didn't have to do any analysis on the stuff that so was there, even though, you know, yeah. uh, there was quite overt um, racism, uh, which I suppose is, is, um, is in every context, really, unfortunately. But... Um, uh, but you know there was absolutely this 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 um, unnameability of racism in the sense that Irish identity was always very hard to artic very hard to um, capture and together and there's a whole kind of uh, field of literature on whiteness and the invis the unmarked nature of uh, I suppose um, the white the white framing of of discourses and of um, the white perspective or the white European perspective on. Uh, on schooling or on what's normal or what's who the other is and those kind of things so um, the invisibility of um, the dominant national group if you like in a lot of uh, talk about the other was one of the main reasons why I, I went to choose discourse analysis because it tends to stop things and say hang on look at the language that you're using and what are mm -hmm. the what are the underpinning assumptions behind it so in in brief um, the the beauty of discourse analysis is that it it, it helps us to test and see if it's meaningful to ask questions about well, wh what's, what, are the, what are the assumptions behind the statement that you've just made? Um, you know, uh, what kind of, I suppose, symbolic or sometimes um, material violence is it enacting? Uh, you know, and that's, that's something that takes an awful lot of pause uh, to get at. Um, what do you mean by material violence mater is well, enacting? Um, that's a good question. <laughs> I suppose in the sense that symbolic violence would be something that um, the, the effect of it is not always clear. It might be something in, in the culture and that uh, there's a culture of marginalisation that's there that the kind of the talk around it is uh, somehow um, uh, it, the, the effects of it are not immediate, but it's, it's part of culture of marginalisation. Marginalization. So othering people in, in certain ways mm -hmm. and seeing them as the other is, a, is, is something that's um, constantly um, happening, if you like. So uh, yeah, but in terms of um, direct violence, I suppose um, I, when I say material, I mean something that has a has a a very clear and very immediate effect. Um, if if you're talking, for example, about speech um, that injur injures people, if you like, mm -hmm. um, and speech that uh, speech that directly injures people, and speech that um, isn't isn't clearly injurious, but is part of a culture. A wider culture that is so i don't know if that if that answers the question yes, yes. Yeah. Well, well i've read some of your examples so i can yeah. see exactly what you mean yeah, it's yeah. where people are being put in their place yeah. or being asked questions to which they can't give an answer yeah. Yeah. or being put in a way that separates them out from some other exactly. group and so on those yeah. kind of things yeah yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. um absolutely yeah um one of the other things from a from a politics point of view and this is something that debra udell's work um this is how i got hooked into Debra deborah's work was what what I saw happening in the Irish setting uh, very clearly was that policymakers, like good globalised policymakers do, um, they borrow rhetoric from other countries um, uh, to to kind of to, uh, to to develop policy, to develop policy around equality, for example. And we have uh, very clear we, we have we were considered Ireland was considered to have some of the most progressive equality legislation at the turn of the millennium. Mm -hmm. which um, was completely uh, pulled, uh, well the legislation wasn't pulled but the funding to support the legislation was complete, was the first thing that went mm -hmm. uh, when the economic crisis hit. But the very interesting thing was we got very good early on at um, 
grant, the Irish government got very good at grandstanding identity categories and saying, you know, we respect all these people individually. And uh, I was kind of interested to say, well, how, you know, uh, how can you talk about people's identity in such a secure way and such a bureaucratic way without ever having seen really grassroots uh, political movements that, that kind of construct those identities? Uh, one thing, Deborah, um, I, I'll just take a quote from her book, um, Impossible Bodies, Impossible Selves. Uh, I guess she's talking about um, the limits of of identity politics that we've seen since civil rights movements, for example. Um, she says that current identity categorizations are not now entirely controlled, uh, if they ever were, by groups by the groups that cite and proliferate them. Uh, as she says, they circulate in mainstream and hegemonic discourses, and in so doing, may well act against the interests of the individuals and groups so named. So just the assumption that having an identity category and saying this is who I am and I need to be recognised as such does not necessarily mean that um, it's a does not necessarily count as an always effective political strategy. Mm. Um, she says examples include how in in kind of dominant and hegemonic discourses, black and African are interchanged with West West Indian, or uh, Negro, or men are substituted by girls. So a kind of um, a sense of how uh, identity categories are actually manipulated. Um, to the um, to the detriment of like of the people that they're supposed to represent. Um, that's not to say for one second that identity categories and politics are useless. Um, and there isn't an, and, and to or, or to discount the, the gains that they've made. But um, in terms of uh, getting back to the question about discourse analysis, um, I suppose uh, what what was interesting was to see how those identities were cited proliferated and used in ways that were um, injurious or ways that were um, shoring up a certain identity in a way that might be exclusionary down the road. Mm -hmm. So discourse analysis really helps to kind of look at the the effective, ineffective, short-term and long-term politics of um, any environment. Um, so yeah, uh, there's a real um, slant towards political theory in, yeah. in what, I, what I eventually ended up doing. Um, How did you judge that they were ineffective or effective strategies? That's a good question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, judgment is, is, is a difficult thing. Um, I'll well, give was it on the basis of how it worked in the setting you were looking mm, at? Or absolutely. was it some longer term? It was, I suppose it's, <clears throat> it's a combination of different things. Um, the, the, the ideas that I used are very much um, uh, questioning representations um, and going on what I've just said, I suppose, in terms of how re useful certain representations are. Um, I ha I, there was a lot of deliberate speculation in what I was doing, and that in itself, I suppose, from a, from a critical theory point of view, is generative in the sense that it, it gets, you know, it, if I can develop this kind of narrative, uh, this kind of questioning of different political strategies, or even to say that there are political strategies taking place, um, that's quite unusual in the education, in the mainstream education context in the first place. So. I couldn't say to you that I, I would never say to you that these are correct or actual um, findings as such. It's more that these are deliberate kind of um, speculations as such on um, the the potential for these strategies to work or not, um, with an eye to um, maybe what's happened in other contexts, what's happened in other research, and what, what I've seen elsewhere. Um, I mean, uh, and and w with a with a kind of a sense of. Um, not just you know borrowing you know what I read from um, someone like Marty McGill, although certainly there were huge resonances and things that I read in his work that I I saw that you know they explained very well what was happening. Um, mm -hmm. So the extent to which something tended to explain um, what was happening, I would definitely use someone else's work in that. But also, um, I wouldn't suggest that my my musings on on the politics of things were. Uh, in some way supposed to be uh, evidence or, you know, this is exactly what's happening in this situation. It's more like what's potentially happening here and what the potential for something, for, for a politics to be closed down is. I, I'm talking very abstractly, so I'll, I'll give you an example, um, of, uh, just a very brief example. I had a boy who I've, I've um, referred to there called Christian, who is, who as um, I, he told me, was Belgian born and of Congolese, his parents are of Congolese origin. And he moved to Dublin, I think, just before he started secondary school. Um, he, for example, would have said that um, racism is an equal opportunities thing. Anybody can be racist. And that statement in and of itself is quite correct. But in context, um, and in terms of the history of, for example, black-white power relations, um, 
in Ireland, not, you know, they do they have happened in Ireland for quite some time as well, just in, in a very um, uh, silenced way, uh, but also um, internationally. Um, that strategy tends to work more for white people than it does <laughs> for black people. Yes. So he's kind of, um, in in a way, uh, I guess, uh, using, a, a, saying, well, look, presenting himself in a certain way and, and I suppose achieving a certain identity that um, gives him a certain form of respect or, or self-worth, if you like, or... Um, you know, it's it's hard to say, uh, but in this in the sense that 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 idea, how effective it is, is questionable. Yeah. Um, yes. yeah. So yeah. there, I guess one hopefully helpful example. Yeah. Yes. So you're you're not in the end saying definitively this works no. or this is effective or this no. doesn't work and so on, but rather the on the balance of probabilities, yeah. this is quite likely to be an yeah. example of yeah. something that yeah. was relatively ineffective. But yeah. we leave that aside as to Absolutely. whether it actually is or not. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah. Yeah. Of course, in, this is an analysis of hegemony as well, and so the idea that for that the, the people I'm, I'm talking about and with are entirely aware and conscious of the use of strategies, yeah. you know, that's right. that's yeah. not really um, in terms of an analysis of hegemony. You wouldn't really say, be be assuming that sometimes they are aware, quite aware of yeah. of, of political strategies, um, but you can never fully say. To what degree that's the case. Yeah. Um, you know. that, that kind of tentative nature of, mm. of, of, of your uh, conclusions or your implicate your, your in inferences, yeah. is that something that's characteristic of discourse analysis in general or is it your particular take on it? Or I think or it's I think it's the particular take <laughs> because I think um, you have there are different there's a spectrum of discourse analysis out there and um, while my understanding of discourse analysis is that it generally tends to be quite, to, to quite critical ends in that mm. it will be problematizing power relations often um, if, if it's in any way in, in using the sociological field for example um, but at, at the same time you could say uh, there are degrees to which people would say would, would uh, um, feel comfortable in saying I'm not exactly sure that this is going on here um, mm. and you also have degrees of reflexivity and understandings of reflexivity um, in terms of the, the, the subjectivity of the, um, the researcher um, in that uh, some would, you know, would say, well, I can to some degree measure and erase or question the degree to which my ability to name and interpret these discourses um, has affected this data, whereas I'm, I suggest that that's quite impossible. Um, I can acknowledge it. So it might have happened, but you can't tell exactly yeah. when and where. I mean, I, I, I need to. Be, uh, the yeah. word I would use is mm. vigilant, mm. Um, yeah. rather than um, definitive uh, yeah. or yeah. being definite. Yeah. You know um, yeah. about it. Yeah, so I was going to take you up on, on mm. which kind of discourse analysis, because when you read really textbooks on this, yeah. there are, you know, there's a Foucauldian and yeah. there's something else and there's a critical and mm. so on. You've not used the word Foucauldian at all in the stuff I've read of yours. Not in the stuff that you read, but um, I have, I did come from, from a Foucauldian. Um, right, I definitely, okay. I mean, I, so you have been influenced by the more absolutely. historical kind of absolutely. political kind of approach yeah, to things. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <coughs> one, uh, and, and, and specifically as well, um, again, using Derrida Udell's work, an application of Judith Butler, um, who uses, I know this is kind of a train of, of different <laughs> schools of, of ideas, but uh, an application of the work of Judith Butler, who would have, who herself is, a, I guess, a feminist philosopher who's used um, Foucault quite a lot. Uh, and one of the one of the things that she, um, that Deborah has, has 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 written about, and that but that has come from Judith Butler, is this idea of citation, that um, the 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 speech acts that we that we um, use or create or perform uh, and the, the bodily acts you know the meaning behind the body bodily acts the movements that we take and the, the symbols that are there mm. the meanings that are there they're all citational in the sense that um, they're citing something that's meaningful or that's that has to some that has some degree gone before um, and knowing exactly the history of where that site you know the the history behind that citation is is quite impossible we can try to estimate you know try to make inferences as such but uh, citations of, of discourses are always um their history is oblique the, where, where they've come from and um how they've developed um, and that's very much for an idea that uh, history is not some sort of unfolding linear chronological tale it's, it's a lot more uh 
complicated than that and yeah. a lot more yeah. kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. So we can know there's a history there somewhere, but yeah. we're not aware. And almost you might say it's impossible to find out yes. because yeah. Yeah. The, the, what a gesture means yeah. will be based upon our previous experience of that yeah. gesture. Yeah. But yeah. getting records of that and finding out how it's exactly. developed over the, the centuries, even perhaps yeah. is almost impossible yeah. to do. Exactly. That. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, how how things are pulled together, how we we a patchwork of different ideas are pulled together and used in certain ways, and we you know as as people we we think that we're very clear on where ideas that com have come from and well I saw that on TV but you know it's it, it's a lot more um, uh, diffuse than that mm -hmm. I guess um, mm -hmm. the, the history of ideas. Yeah. You know. I'm presuming this reinforces the point you were saying earlier on about being tentative and, yes. and, and not definitive about what you were saying that yeah. because in a sense we can't do yeah. that there's a limit to what Absolutely. we can say, you know. And that, that in itself <coughs> is supposed to be um, in terms of the, you know advancing or trying to, to add to critical theory that's actually a political strategy in the sense that um, if, I, if I'm going to talk about racism in education which is what I'm supposed to be doing here um, I'm going to say well you can use those kinds of ideas to talk about racism and to, to you know the um, Judith Butler has an interesting um, idea she, she talks about how the articulation of an identity is actually and it's, it's not just an it's not an, an you, you could you could view it as a narration of the set of the subject but what she says is actually I see it as a interruption of the subject in that it it, it kind of it forecloses mm. um, and bounds the person in a certain way and um, that can have a strategic use and that say obviously saying who we all say we all have a sense of identity but um, she says that um, democracy would would proceed undemocratically if we had kind of um, a clear idea of who it was supposed to represent all the time you know mm. because mm. things change yeah. And new, yeah. new people, you know, subjugated voices um, are, you know, are need to be sort of searched out, and uh, and yeah, it's it's ongoing. <laughs>